boss got a sick man inside. Hey, Doc! Doc, come on here, quick! Yeah. Got a fellow sick out here on stagecoach. Doc, about 10 miles back, he got chest pains. I had to run my team full out. Oh, I'm Dr. Martin. I think he's a little bit better now, Doctor. Mr. Wilson, the doctor's here. Thanks, little Joe. Couldn't have stopped him without you. That's all right, Clint. Here, lend me a hand, will you, fellas? Got him all right, Austin? I got him, Joe. You must be the man who stopped the horses. Yes, ma'am. I'm Joe Cartwright. How do you do? Here, let me give you a hand. Thank you. Will you show me how to get to the manor house? I'll do one better than that. I'll take you there myself. Got any luggage? Here you go, little Joe. That is it, isn't it? <laughs> okay, here we go. You're kind of young to be traveling around by yourself, aren't you? I'm 19. Oh, come on. I really am. Nobody ever believes me, but I'm 19. How long are you going to be here? Only a few days. And the introductions were cut short. I didn't get your name. I'm Wendy Daniels. And you'd rather not be called Mr. Cartwright? Well, not if I have a choice. You do, Joe. Hey, you know anybody here in Virginia City? Not a person, until my father arrives. And then I may not know him. But you won't know your own father? I haven't seen him in five years. It's been such a long time. Coming here is the most exciting thing that ever happened to me. Now, it's been a pretty exciting day for me, too. See, I got up this morning, made out a feed list. I met the prettiest girl in the whole world. Don't blow away the cake. Oh, oh I gotta get my wish. <laughs> Joe, you've been uh, with us all evening, and yet you haven't been. You've been off in a fog somewhere. Oh, I'm sorry, Pa. I was just thinking about a girl who came in on the stage this morning. She's so beautiful, I can't even tell you about her. She uh, hit you pretty bad, huh? Yeah, she's a real beauty, Paul. Was she ever? She. She had real light eyes. Kind of like milk glass, just with a little tint of blue. Beautiful blonde hair. Yeah, it was real shiny, like a... like a polished saddle buckle. Glinting in the sunlight. Right, Joe? Ah, oh, shut up and cut the cake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it looks good. <laughs> hey, that's her. Hi, Wendy. Hi, Joe. How nice. I'm uh, with my father and my brother. It's my brother Horse's birthday. We're having a little celebration. Could you join us? All right, for a few moments. Good. Pa, I'd, uh, I'd like to present Miss Wendy Daniels. This is my father and my brother Hoss. Howdy, how are you? Mr. Cartwright, Hoss, happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Wendy said she could join us for a few moments. Oh, wonderful. That makes this occasion all the more auspicious. Please. Thank you. Joe told us that you uh, arrived this morning on stage. Yes, by relay from Chicago. Uh -huh. I'll be meeting my father here in a few days. He'll be arriving from Denver. 
Is he coming here on business? Mm-hmm. He's been visiting several cities during the past couple of months, trying to arrange details for a stage and freight company. Virginia City will be his terminal. He wanted me here with him to celebrate his triumph. Well, the way Virginia City is growing by leaps and bounds, I guess we could stand another stage line. He plans to give Wells Fargo a run for their money. They gave you a pretty good run for yours this morning. It surely was a wild introduction to the West. Here. Have a piece of birthday cake. Thank you. And a little champagne. Martha, could I have a plate and a glass, please? Uh, organizing a, a stage line presents certain difficulties for, for an Easter, doesn't it? Father thinks in large terms. The greater right. the challenge, the better. <laughs> Here you are, Joe. Talk about a big challenge. Us? <laughs> <laughs> good. There we are. That cake looks awful good. Mm -hmm. Sure does. sure does. Here you are, Paul. Man, that's, that's family size cake. <laughs> I got a family size brother. <laughs> I got a family size appetite. <laughs> there we are. May I propose a toast? To Haas? And to my father? That chair almost suggests he's with us. To Haas Cartwright. May the future be even brighter and more successful than the past. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> A field of four-leaf clovers. Yeah, without bees, I hope. <laughs> to my father, who's always filled the cup of my dreams and the special country of my heart. To Taylor Daniels, who can sing you a sonnet, build you a bridge, or, or harness a river just to satisfy your whim of the moment. To my father, I believe I spoke over long. Oh, no, of course not, dear. That was a beautiful toast. We'll drink to your father. I'm sorry. I must leave now. Oh. I'm afraid your western wine is a little bit too much for me. Well. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Western wine. Bottled in France. Western France, I mean. Wendy? You forgot something. What? You forgot to say you'd go riding with me tomorrow. Riding? Well, I don't know if I should, Joe. Oh, why not? Well, suppose my father should arrive. I wouldn't want to be out of town. Well, you said he wouldn't be here for a couple of days. Well, suppose he should arrive early. Well, I wasn't planning a ride to St. Louis. I'll have you back by the afternoon. All right, look, have it your own way. I'll be by with a stereopticon, and while you're looking at the pictures, I'll wave a fan in your face and do my world-famous impression of horse's hooves. How's that sound? <laughs> oh, we really have some beautiful country around here. We've got mountains, trees, lakes. There's only one thing that's missing. What's that? That's you, riding next to me. You certainly don't give up easily, do you? Well, it's that or the stereopticon. <laughs> All right. Be by around noon. Buggy or stereopticon? Use your own judgment. Daniels? Good afternoon, Mr. Cartwright. Well, how are you? Just fine. Well, you enjoying your visit to our part of the country? I know my, my son is enjoying the pleasure of your company. It's been very nice. He's taking me for a ride this afternoon to see the lake. Oh, you'll love it. It's beautiful. Well, Mr. Huber. Mr. Cartwright. <laughs> you have a very special customer here. You know that, don't you? Yes. I'm well aware of that. 
You make sure that she gets everything she can possibly need. <laughs> well, Miss Daniels, I've checked. But there haven't been any wires or mail on your behalf from Denver. I see. Well, no matter. Father often forgets personal details when he's involved in business. Most men do. I'll contact you the moment anything comes through. Thank you, Mr. Huber. Good day. Good day. Ben, got a minute? Sure, Jim. What can I do for you? Sit down. Um, tell me about Miss Daniels. Miss Daniels? Well, she's a, <laughs> a pretty young lady. <laughs> I don't know very much about her. Well, Joseph introduced her to me, my son. She has an inexcusably neglectful father. He hasn't sent her any money. Oh, really? I don't have to look inside her purse to know that she hasn't got any funds. Hmm. Well, my father's a substantial businessman. He, he's setting up his terminal for the stage line right here in Virginia City. He'll probably be doing business with you. Oh, it slipped his mind. Why did you extend her some credit? My first obligation is to the depositors, I know, but she's a young lady. She needs help. I can't do that, Ben. You can't do that. Hand me one of those checks. What for? I'd like one of those blank checks, if you don't mind. What are you going to Jim, do? Jim, will you please give me one of those blank checks? All right, all right. put $300 in her account. All right. But if she uh, finds out where the money came from, being an unmarried, unattached woman, she may feel that she's being put in a compromising light. Oh, Jim, compromised. <laughs> now, see how you've got me involved? Involved? Jim, why don't you go fishing? It'll restore your sense of human values. How long has it been since you've seen your father? Five years he's been away. And I'll see him in two days. I can hardly believe it, Joe. What kept him in Mexico so long? Oh, it was all pretty secret. I didn't know much myself until lately. He was with Benito Juarez. The president of Mexico. Before and after the revolution. My father was a foreigner, but he was one of Juarez's advisors. On his staff. Hmm. That's kind of a kind of a soldier of fortune, huh? I like to think that. He's so many things. But mostly he's well, I guess you could call him an adventurous businessman. He must be adventurous, all right. It's not gonna be any easy job going up against the Wells Fargo. Daddy's company plans to help the small settlements where Wells Fargo doesn't go. Bringing medicine and supplies. And he'll accept barter if he can't pay the fare. He's very idealistic, even in business. Sounds like a fine man. He plans to start small, like a pebble in the water, but from sky high. You could feel his own excitement when he wrote me. Close your eyes, Wendy, and see the clipper ships. Beautiful, proud, driving fast to the wind, and you'll be at the bow of every one of them. You're kind of spreading yourself a little thin, isn't it? No, silly. He means figureheads carved in the bows of ships. Oh. You're making fun of me. Mm -hmm. 
Honestly, Joe, it's kept me awake some. I lie there seeing myself as, as Empress of Asia or, or Star of India, racing the dolphins on every ocean in the world. <laughs> Wendy, you are an incurable dreamer. Is that wrong, Joe? No, I guess not. It's so... It's so like a fairy tale. Do they ever come true? Oh, sure they do. This ranch, Ponderosa, that was my father's dream. He worked hard and he made it come true. So there's hope for yours. You think so? Really do? Who in the world wouldn't do anything for a girl like you? I'm gonna get you back to the hotel. Who told her that I had deposited the money in her account? She asked directly. I had to give her an honest answer. Had to give her an honest answer. He couldn't have been tactful. Ben, in my business, tact yields to honesty. Sure. Though in this case, I must admit I was sorely tempted. All right, so she wouldn't take any money out of the account. Naturally, I was concerned about her. Young girl like that. Uh, she doesn't see things as they really are. I wanted to help her. Well, it's very commendable. So, I sent a wire off to the manager of the Denver Bank, who happens to be an old school chum of mine. Oh, get to the point, Jim. I merely suggested that he try to approach Miss Daniel's father and sort of nudge him to transfer some of his funds to his daughter. I wish you'd suggested that he nudge Mr. Daniels before this. Well, anyway, I uh, waited at the bank for a return wire. It seems Mr. Daniels closed his account in Denver, a small account, a week ago. He did have a letter of credit on a bank in New York, upon which he had drawn heavily. But, Ben, the worst of it is... is what? My friend in Denver inquired at his hotel. Our Mr. Daniels checked out of the hotel three days ago, left no forwarding address. There's no trace of him. He just disappeared. Huh. I hope you understand, Miss Daniels. Uh, if it was up to me, uh, we have a house rule here that when the bill reaches $50, I understand, Mr. Woods. There's no need to explain. I wish I could let you stay. I really do. Haven't you any friends in Virginia City? I'll pack right away. Now, excuse me, ma'am. Sounds like you need a friend. My name's... Here, here. Now, you don't have to run away. I'm really not hard to get to know. Besides, I might be a great help to you. Please, leave me alone. Now, look, this is a pretty rough town for a young lady to be in. Unescorted. Some of these men around here might get the wrong idea about a girl being alone. I'm afraid I... Excuse... Now, look, I'll tell you what. Why don't you... Why don't you find the door, mister? Nobody asked for your advice, Sonny, so beat it, will you? I'm taking you out of here. Where can I go? You'll stay with us out at the ranch till your father gets here. Go on up and get your things ready.
come on, don't look so worried. We'll be there pretty soon. Always seems longer the first time. I know. I was just wondering. Yeah, about what? If this is the way Mother felt when she was left alone, you would have liked a little Joe. If she was anything like you are, I would have. She wasn't. She had poise. Nothing ever seemed to bother her. Even when nothing seemed right, she was always alone. Father was off somewhere trying to conquer the world, I suppose. But she didn't seem to mind. She was always there, always devoted to him. Even when she died. Well, you're here now. And there's a difference. I'm here, too. Are you, Joe? Truly? I wonder if anyone ever gets over feeling alone. You just give me a chance to show you. Come on. have to get to work. We got those horses to bring in this morning. You going riding this afternoon? Your father asked me to go to town with him. But if he won't mind. Well, of course I won't. <laughs> hey, Joe, you think we can move all them horses by noon? Sure we can. I gotta do is stop eating and start working. Excuse me. Well, I don't know what's come over him, Wendy. Before you got here, I used to have to beat him all the way to the barn to get him to do a day's work. <laughs> You really don't mind? Hmm? My breaking our date. Oh, come on. Of course not. <laughs> You'll enjoy riding. Thank you. For what? For being the way you are. For letting me be a part of your family. We never had much of a family life. 
father was away most of the time. He was always off building castles shining in Spain. It was kind of like a dream, not solid and sure like you. Oh, Wendy, you know, there are solid dreams, too. And solid dreamers. And the combination of the two is what makes for change and growth. And uh, it could very well be that your father is one of those solid dreamers. And maybe that's why he hasn't been around the house too much, because he's been so busy away building. Yes. I know. It's, it's just that... Well, knowing you has made me learn what it's like to have a father. Thank you. That's very nice of you to say that, thank you. Now, you enjoyed this afternoon's ride. I will. Mm. Good day, Mr. Cartwright. Hello, Martha. Over here if you're searching for an honest man. <laughs> I'm searching for a good beefsteak. That's what I'm searching for. How are you? <laughs> Fine, Ben. Uh, how are you getting on with your house guest? Oh, splendidly. Wendy's a charming young lady. Charming. Uh, have you heard anything uh, about our missing Mr. Daniels? If this is his destination, he'll be here tomorrow. Mm. Oh, Martha. I want you to bring me the best beefsteak you can find at this hotel. You know the way I like it done. And some uh, more little potatoes and some peas. Yes, Mr. Cartwright. Ben, does it seem at all strange to you that we are collectively stricken with this sudden interest in a young woman we know nothing about? No. No, not at all. You know why? Because she's vulnerable. Oh, I know, she, uh, she looks uh, at her father through a gossamer veil, but uh, I think that's kind of nice. Yes, that is a nicer sentiment, Ben. But I do have a responsibility to this town. Now, what does that mean? Well, Taylor Daniels has written directly to the merchants. And the word has gotten around that his terminal will be here. That means increased business and jobs. Well, he sure has lit a pretty big fuse. I hope he can carry through with the promised fireworks. So do I. <laughs> so does everybody else, I guess. Ah, oh, now, come on. Aren't you being a little hard on a man that you haven't even met yet? Oh, no, no. Not me. Others. I am a little cowed by their opinions. They don't exactly jive with uh, Wendy's high regard for her father. Uh-huh. Well, received this AM from New York. Be advised of immediate cancellation. <clears throat> Letter of uh, credit issued Daniel Stage and Freight Company. Advance no further funds, all Western banks being notified. Who's that from? Daniel's bankers. He's on his own, Ben, when he gets here. If he gets here. Joe, you might ought to check that stirrup back there. Hmm? I don't reckon I'll ever make a Westerner out of him, Wendy. <laughs> At your service, ma'am. Oh, what a gentleman you are. That's right. <laughs> well, Wendy, have as good a time as possible under the circumstances. <laughs> said anything to me in so long, when you finally decide to talk to me again, I hope it's something really important. 
I'm sorry, Joe. It's just that... Well, look at that. It's so beautiful. And a little bit sad, too. Oh, why sad? Well, my father always said that... Oh, no. <laughs> What's the matter? I don't believe it. I'm Joe Cartwright. You must be Mr. Taylor Daniels. Now, you have to be. That's why I talk to you every time you talk to me. Find out what Mr. Daniels is doing, what Mr. Daniels is thinking, what Mr. Daniels is going to be doing in the future. You know, just for once, I'd like to find out something about Wendy. I don't know what to tell you. Tell me anything. Do you like prunes? No. Neither do I. How about plums? <laughs> I love them. Same here, but it doesn't make sense, because a prune is just a plum that's been in the bath too long. Now, prunes and plums aren't much, but they're a start. Now, what else is there about Wendy? Well, there's the Wendy Daniels who, who was the best speller in the first grade. Excellent. Then there's the Wendy Daniels who used to go and collect seashells at the age of 12. Do you the sound of the sea that was locked inside of them? And then there's the Wendy Daniels of right here and right now. And the last one's my favorite. Hi. I'm Joe Cartwright. Hello, Mr. Cartwright. I'm Wendy Daniels. Taylor Daniels, of the Daniels Stage and Freight Company. Oh, yes, Mr. Daniels. I'm acquainted with your enterprise. My name is Huber. Please come in. Oh, thank you. Have a chair. <clears throat> what can I do for you? I've just arrived from Denver, but I thought I'd check momentarily if you had any correspondence regarding our company. As a matter of fact, yes. A wire from New York. Oh? Your letter of credit, Mr. Daniels. It's been revoked. May I see the wire? Certainly. Yes. Yes, I had it here somewhere. I've told them never to clear this desk. Oh, here it is. I'm sorry, Mr. Daniels. Sorry? For what? For announcing to me that I'm ruined? That my enemies have finally pulled me down into the mud? Taylor Daniels. Oh. My daughter is registered here, I believe. Oh, Miss Daniels? Not anymore, she isn't. What do you mean? Well, uh, the young lady was unable to pay her hotel bill. Are you telling me you evicted my daughter? Well, I wouldn't exactly say that she was on the curb. She could have paid her bill with the money that Mr. Cartwright put up. Cartwright? Who is he? Well, he's the fellow who offered her $300 and took her in at the Ponderosa Ranch, where she is now. My daughter is staying at this Ponderosa with Mr. and Mrs. Cartwright? No, not exactly. Uh, there is no Mrs. Cartwright. 
Who else knows my daughter is staying there? But who else? Well, just about everybody in Virginia City, I guess. Oh, please, Mr. Daniels, will you lay off? You're, you're about to choke me. Take a rest. All right, can I help you? I'm looking for a man named Cartwright. Well, I guess I qualify. I'm Joe Cartwright. Cartwright, I've always prided myself on being a civilized human being. There's only one way to treat a person like you. Now, what was that for? For my daughter's reputation. I'm Taylor Daniels. You got this whole thing wrong. Have I? I don't think so. Now look, you're gonna listen to me. Joseph! Joseph! What's this all about? This is Wendy's father. I'm afraid he's got a few things mixed up. You better do some explaining. This boy better do some explaining. He abducted my daughter. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. My son offered a young lady a decent home. And she accepted it for the sake of her self-respect. My daughter is my responsibility. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear you say that. Why don't you live up to it? Why do you leave her stranded here in Virginia City without even paying her hotel bill? Let me tell you something about your daughter. She's a warm, lovely, courageous girl, and you ought to be proud of her. I can understand perhaps you're wondering about my son's intentions, but he had no need to question hers. Things have been so... I've been so upset... I guess I've been taking it out on everybody. Looks as though I've made a complete fool of myself, doesn't it, Mr. Cartwright? I don't know how I can... Why don't we just forget it? Joe, why don't you tell Wendy your father's here? Right. Mr. Daniels, let's go in the house. Just a minute. Your father's here. Joe! You're not joking. He's downstairs right now. Oh, Joe, I knew it. I knew he'd come. Do you think I look all right? I think you look beautiful. But what if he doesn't like me? So how could he help but like you? Oh, I'm not like Mother. She was always so poised. She always knew just what to say to him. Joe. I'm scared. Look, there's nothing to be scared about. That's your father downstairs. But you don't understand. He's not like other men. Mother always told me that, that he needed someone to stand beside him to help him from being afraid. When she died, I promised I would try to... Oh, Joe, I'm so happy. What's the matter? Nothing's the matter. I'm just real happy for you, that's all. Okay, well, go on downstairs, your father's waiting. Mr. Cartwright. Mm. Okay, I think it's about time that I start calling you Taylor, you start calling me Ben. Well, I could use a friend, Ben. I don't know how I'm going to face Wendy. I... I'm finished. I'm wiped out. I set out to conquer the world. Hmm. Well, you've had uh, some kind of business reverse, and now... and now you feel you're an utter failure. Well, let me tell you something. That's not the picture of Taylor Daniels that I get from your daughter. They always set me on a pedestal. Both Wendy and her mother. 
But somehow I was always falling off. And this time I think for good. My credit has been cut off, do you understand? Yes. Yes, I understand. Credit? Letters of introduction, vouchers, mortgages. They all seemed very important to me at one time. And then I discovered something of greater importance. Something much more meaningful to me. I discovered how important my sons are to me. You know, Taylor, our children are the only immortality we have. What would a man like me do with a child? I purposely avoided seeing her for years. Even after my wife died, I, I couldn't bear to see Wendy. I never had been a father to her, and it was too late to start. And yet you, you wrote her, asking her to meet you here. Oh, yes, when I thought I was going to succeed. I wrote I could afford to write. With all kinds of reams and reams of glittering promises and nonsense. Seas and sailing ships. <laughs> I'm a rotten failure. Oh, I don't mean to trouble you. I'm sorry. And when Wendy comes down, I tell her I'm sorry. It's easy to love a dream, Wendy. It's a lot tougher to love a human being. father's here and he needs you. He needs you now more than ever before. You really do want to fail, don't you? No man wants to fail, Ben, but even a fool knows when he's beaten. And you are beaten. You're so completely beaten that you're ready to run away just as you have success in your hands. I don't understand. I told you. You told me about credit. I'm talking about your daughter. Taylor, if you walk out this door right now, you will fail. Not only for yourself, but for Wendy. Your whole life will have been a failure. Father. Wendy. Wendy, I... I... I don't want to know anything. I don't want to hear anything. I just want you to hold me. Wendy will be out in a minute. She's saying goodbye to little Joe. Taylor, I know that my friends in San Francisco are looking forward to hearing about your plans for the stage line. Of course, I'm looking forward to seeing the first run. Without you, it would not have been possible. Well, I guess you can say maybe without a daughter's faith in her father, it mightn't have been possible. It's going to be pretty lonely around here without you. You taught me what it was like not to be alone. I'll never forget it. Loneliness is a deep well. Maybe I can help fill it for my father for a while. And then? San Francisco isn't so very far away, is it? No, I guess it's not. Thank you enough. Hey, Wendy, we're going to miss you.
เหมือนเดียวThanks anyway. Everything's going at your place. Ah, uh, you know, Pa's been keeping me busy. 
We've been clearing that new ground, and that doesn't leave me too much time for anything <laughs> else. Paul wants to plow it this fall. Have you heard anything from Adam? Yeah, yeah, got a letter from him last week. He's in Paris now. He's wow. going to spend the winter and spring there. Boy, would I love to see some of those places. My ma used to always tell me about London and Paris and Rome, and she'd been to every one of them. Well, who knows, you might get to see him someday. Uh, those places might as well be on the other side of the moon, as far as I'm concerned. I'm lucky to get off the farm long enough to go to Virginia City. Yeah, well, that makes two of us. You going into town? Yeah. Listen, give me time to saddle up my horse, I'll go with you. Sure. Buy you a beer. Although that is, if your pot don't mind. Well, I've... I've never had a beer, or even been in a saloon, for that matter. I guess it's about time. Good deal, I'll be with you in a minute. Good. You got the wagon unloaded. Yeah, the sacks gave out about 10 seconds before I did. Well, I don't know about you. I'm ready for the beer. Come on. No, maybe I better. Ah, oh, come on, Annie. One beer's not going to hurt anything. Hey, that song. Where's it coming from? Annie, it is coming from the same place where we're going to get the beer. Come on, let's go. Lovely ribbon, scarlet ribbon, scarlet ribbons for her hair. Come on, Lil, pick it up. Your feet are dragging. Look, at this hour of the morning, I'm lucky to be standing on them. All the stores were closed and shuttered. All the streets were dark and bare. In our town, no scarlet ribbons. Not Howdy. Ribbons Good morning, old Joe. Have yeah, a couple of beers, Cosmo. Right away. Just before the dawn was breaking, I peeked in and on her bed in gay profusion lying there. Lovely ribbons, scarlet ribbons. Two beers, old Joe. Yeah, thanks, Cosmo. Any your beers here? I will never know from where came What's the matter? You want something stronger? No, it's not that. Huh? Lovely ribbons, it's not that. Ribbons, what? I can't hear you. I said she's singing it all wrong. I haven't even finished my first cup of coffee, and already I've got a critic. Uh, he, he didn't mean anything by that, Miss Lily. Uh, he, he was just kidding you. Y yes, ma'am. you got a right to sing it any way you want to. Oh, even if I was singing it all wrong, huh? Y yes, ma'am. Even then. <laughs> Whoever made you a critic, Mr. Whatever your name is? My ma, she, she didn't make me an expert on music, but she did teach me how that song ought to be sung. Hey, Mike, let's listen to the maestro here. Let him show us how the song really ought to be done. Well, sure, if you really want me to. Step right up, take stage. The, the way you did it was just fine, except a little bit slower. To say good night, then I heard my child in prayer, and for me some scarlet ribbons, scarlet ribbons for my hair. Oh. Stars were closed and shuttered on. Hey, kid, keep going. No, I, uh, I better not. Well, I've heard enough. Enough to know you've got a beautiful voice. Well, it gets the hogs in for feeding at least. 
Well, you sure surprised me, Eddie. I thought it was great. Thank you, Joe. How long you been studying, kid? Well, the only studying I ever did is what my ma used to teach me. But why'd she stop? She died four years ago. Why? Well, I better be getting back because my pa wouldn't like my being here. See you, Joe. No, I'm coming with you. Take it easy. Thanks for the beer, Charlie. Sure, Charlie. You ain't eating, you sick. No, Pa, I'm fine. I was just thinking. Well, thinking don't stick to your ribs like stew. They won't get that plow picked up in town tomorrow. I haven't forgotten the plow, Pa. I'm just remembering that piano we had when Ma was with us. Did you ever think about getting us another piano, Pa? No. I just thought it'd be nice to have a little music around the house, that's all. We had music around when your mom was alive. When she died, so did music. What got you thinking about a piano? Oh, nothing, Pa. It just crossed my mind, that's all. Well, uncross it. Maybe birds got time for songs, but farmers don't. Ma used to say it, the whole world's a song if you just listen hard enough. Yeah, she did say that. But she's gone. There'll never be another like her. You're right, Pa. There'll never be anybody like her. Thank you, Pa. Mike, play the kids' version of the Scarlet Ribbons, hmm? picture this. We had half the place mad with us because we played Dixie. And the other half is mad because we played Battle Hymn of the Republic. Now, if you think this is such an easy job, what do you think we played to keep peace? Beats me. God save the queen, confused them all. 
<laughs> well, I think I'm gonna go over and see if I got any room at the barber shop. You... No, just a trim. <laughs> Lily, why don't you ask Andy about, you know, what we talked about the other night? <laughs> yes, I will. What, uh, what were you supposed to ask me about? Andy, how would you like to work here? Me? I don't know how to do anything in a saloon. Well, you can sing. Yeah, but I'm not a real singer. Ah, but you could be. And I could start teaching you. Look, Andy, I've been around singers, sweet and sour, all of my life. And I know you can make it. No, my pa never let me. Working in a saloon. It's not what you work inside of that counts, Andy. It's what's inside of you. Don't you want to sing? I think you'd like to try it, wouldn't you? Yeah. I guess I would. Then ask your pa. Just ask him. For me. I, uh, I better be getting home. Bye, Miss Lily. Bye. But it's not as if I'll be away when you need me, Paul. I've said all I'm going to say about it, boy. Okay, Pa, you've had your say. Now let me have mine. You already have. But, Pa, she's just going to teach me how to sing right. That's all. Disrespect for your father is what you'll be teaching you. I don't want you having anything to do with a saloon girl like her. Pa, she's a nice lady, and she says I got a real good voice. I've said all I'm going to say about it, boy. But, Paul, all I want is... What you want don't matter. Can't you understand that? Yeah, Paul, I'm getting to understand that real well. What's that mean? It means I, I've had enough of that kind of talk, Paul. Now I'm... I'm warning you. You're warning me? Just what you got in mind, Mr. Big Britches. I'll leave, Paul. I'll leave and I'll never come back. Pack up and get out any time suits you. But, Pa, I'm your son. I lost my son about 30 seconds ago. I don't think it's anybody's fault. It's just a natural way of things. I can't be just a son for always. I gotta be a man on my own. So it's natural for a son to leave. But it ain't natural that it's gotta be done with so much pain. Pa's been afraid ever since you left, Mom. It's like he thinks the only thing that he can love is just the earth. Not the people. Not the things they do, but just the earth. Ma used to always tell me that if I listened real hard, I could hear the breeze singing. Well, I hope someday a, a good breeze will come along and you'll be able to hear me too. Goodbye, Ma.
panic. How you doing? Fine, just fine, little Joe. Yeah, I can, uh, I can see that by the sign. Yeah, just fine if you overlook the fact that I left home and I'm flat broke. You sure you're doing the right thing? Yeah, and don't try to talk me out of it because I've made my own decision. And I'm gonna be a singer. Miss Lily's gonna help me. Look, I wasn't trying to talk you out of anything. I was trying to talk you into a job. We got some horses out at the ranch that need breaking. We need another man. Not anymore, you don't. We got a deal. Come on down to the stable, I'll get your horse. How you doing? I have had some day. I feel like I've been busting Bronx for a week. Are you trying to tell me you're not going to sit down for dinner? <laughs> Listen, I want to tell you, I'm real proud of you, though. You didn't know, but I had an eye on you today. You did real fine. Well, thank you for giving me the job. Well, thank you for taking it. Of course, don't rest on your laurels. We got quite a tough batch of horses picked out for you tomorrow. Nothing like those feather beds you were on today. None of those feather beds like you had today. You could have gone all week without saying that. <laughs> Come on, I'll get you some liniment. Okay. The pipes, the pipes are calling From glen to glen And down the mountainside The summer's gone And all the roses are falling Tis you, tis you must go, and I must bide. But come you back when summer's on the meadow, or when the valley's hushed. And white with snow It's I'll be here And sunlight on In shadow Oh, Danny boy Oh, Danny boy I don't know nobody named Danny, but doggone it, every time I hear that, it chokes me up. I think maybe the way Andy was singing it had something to do with that house. Gee, I hope Adam doesn't mind my using his guitar. Oh, heck, none of us can play. It was just gathering dust till you picked it up. You keep playing it that way. <laughs> I understand you're taking some singing lessons, too. Well, sort of. I mean, not from a real teacher. It's just Miss Lily down at the Silver Dollar. Now, Andy, just because Miss Lily sings with a silver dollar doesn't mean that she can't sing or teach. Hey, they offered you a job over there at the silver dollar, didn't they? Yeah, start this Friday if I want to. Did you uh, tell your pa about this? Well, I better be getting over to the bunkhouse. I got a long day tomorrow.
Good night, fellas. Excuse me, sir. Good night. Good night, Andy. Paul, I wish somebody could, I don't know, talk to his father, try to explain the boy's side of it. Yeah. Well, let's go to bed. Yeah. So come me back when summer's in got nothing to say to each other. Well, something I'd like to say to you. You know, Andy's working at the Ponderosa. You can tell him from me. Ain't no use sending you here begging my forgiveness. Well, he didn't send me here. There's doers and there's dreamers in this world, Ben. And a dreamer's just bound to get in my way. His mother did that. She was a good woman. Meant a whole lot to me, she did. But she had her head in the clouds. Head and heart, too, for all I know. She was a fine woman. And she never seemed to understand that life is hard facts. She taught Andy to think like she did. Singing ain't gonna fix this old fence of mine. Now, Willard, the way Andy sings, you ought to be proud of him. Do you know that... That people are paying to hear him sing? For money? Where? At the Silver Dollar. I'd be obliged if you'd let me get on with the work, Ben Cartwright. All right, Willard. You keep right on building that fence. You make sure it's real strong so nobody can get in. And make sure it's real high, so nobody can look in and see how alone Willard Walker really is. A brand new, wonderful singing talent, a young man from your own Virginia City, Mr. Andrew Walker! To say good night, then I heard my child in prayer. Send to God some scarlet ribbon, scarlet ribbon for my hair. All the stars were closed and shuttered. 
on the street were dark and bare. In our town, no scarred with ribbons. Hey, Lily. Sam here just told a story. Sam just told a story that's going to get you thrown out of here in your backside if you don't shut up and listen. Now pipe down, you galoots. We don't want any trouble. How much more shame and humiliation I got to take in account of your singing, boy? No more, Paul. No more. I come over and see how you're doing. Fine. I talked to Lily. She wanted me to come over and tell you how bad she felt about the other night. She kind of feels responsible for what happened. It wasn't her fault, Joe. It wasn't anybody's fault but mine. I disobeyed my father, little Joe. I disgraced him by making a public spectacle out of myself by singing in a saloon. But I'll never do it again. Because I'll never sing again. Oh, look, that doesn't make sense. There was nothing wrong with what you did. There's nothing wrong with singing. Singing's a sin, little Joe. My pa made me see it, and I see it. I hurt him, and I humiliated him. I'll never sing again. Take it easy. That wagon load of horseshoes? Yeah. Also run into Indian Town. Looks like you had that situation pretty well figured out. Yeah. You don't laugh anymore, you don't smile. It doesn't seem like he enjoys life at all. Getting more like old Willard every day. Yeah, I was afraid of that. 
Father's got him convinced that singing and laughing are a sin. I just sorry to hear that. Well, it looks like there ought to be something we could do. I mean, get them together and talk to them. Maybe invite them over for dinner or something, huh? Yeah, what about on Easter Sunday? I think we ought to do something like that. That gives me an idea. Like what? You fellas go ahead and eat. I got me an errand to do. Good afternoon, Willard. Good afternoon, Robert. Uh, Willard, I brought Reverend Porter along because, uh, well, there's something that uh, he thinks you can help him with, uh, if you will, that is. Well, if I can, I uh, expect I'll help. Well, Willard, you might say this concerns my entire congregation. As you know, Easter services will be held in a few days, and, uh, well... Well, what Reverend Porter's trying to say is that he'd like Andy to sing in his church on Easter Sunday. Well, that's... Hard to say. There's chores and... Willard. Willard in church. Now, there's nothing heathenish about that, is there? I mean, he's not going to be doing the devil's work in Reverend Porter's chapel now, is he? Well, I, I never thought of it. Your wife used to sing for us, Willard. And I'm told that Andy here has her same feeling for a song. It would certainly be a shame if that feeling couldn't be put to use for the benefit of the Lord on that most holy of days. Yeah, sure would be a shame. But it's, uh, it's up to, it's up to you, Willard. And he's your son. The boy can make up his own mind. He did before. It's your decision, son. But I think I know what your mother would want you to do. Yes, sir. I'll sing if you want me to. Well, you got what you come for. If you'd let us get on with our work now. Little Joe told me I'd find you here. I came to congratulate you. What for? Because of your singing again. You are going to sing again, aren't you? <sighs> Reverend Porter asked me to. But... But it's... It's not the same. It used to be that singing was like a deep breath on a spring morning to me. Now it's something I'll do because I said I would, that's all. There's no joy anymore. But, Andy... It's true, Miss Lily. You saw my father in the saloon. It doesn't matter whether he's right or wrong. I just know that I never want to be the cause of that much pain again. Andy, I suppose I'm the last one to talk about what's right or wrong, but well, there's one thing I know. 
If there's anything in this, this whole world that's right, it's your singing. That joy will return, Andy. I know it will. Mr. Cartwright. Where's your pa? I guess he isn't coming. It's Easter Sunday. Well, he's clearing the new field. He says that going to church is a waste of time. Catch up with you. Well, let me help you with that. No, I can get it alone. Well, it's gonna take all morning, isn't it? I ain't got nothing else to do. Aren't you coming to church with me? What for? Listen to that boy bellow like a sick calf? No. Well, it mean an awful lot to the boy. I got more important things to do here. Lord made a man to work, didn't he? Well, even the Lord rested on the seventh day when he looked at his labor and saw it was good. If you're going to quote the Bible at me, Ben, what about the fifth commandment? Honor thy father. It's a commandment that I've lived by, an unwritten one. Honor thy son. I ain't wrong. A man was made for work. What else are we good for? They said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Sinners were slain 
So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my throat is at last I lay down I will wife used to sing that song. It's beautiful the way he sings it. Till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross. And Powers likes to look good for the crowd. Make it easy, Charlie. Boy, there's only supposed to be a show for the rules here. You're lucky we've got these mitts on. I'll break your head. Charlie's hitting him too hard, Dugan. Can't you make him stop? Oh, don't worry, Ruby. Thanks, a good old lad. He can take care of himself. Hey, hot shot. Hank takes Charlie. I got ten dollars so you can take both of them. Come on! What's the matter with him? What, you're trying to kill him? Just show him who's boss in this ring, that's all. Ladies and gentlemen! This exciting exhibition is declared a draw. Let's have a big hand for Charlie Powers. Big show off. Remember when they cheered that way for us? I still say you can lick either one of them. Yeah, maybe with a sledgehammer. Ladies and gentlemen, we come now to the next exciting event. Charlie Powers, contender for the world's heavyweight title, challenges any man here to match pugilistic skills with him. And to any man who can last four rounds with him, the management will award the sum of $200 in cash. <laughs> $200, really? $200. Yeah, yes. Don't you start getting no ideas, Joe. Oh, come on, you can stay four rounds with him in your sleep. And to make this even more sporting, I personally will cover all bets at five to one odds that no man can last the four round limit. <laughs> How do you know you try? You're bigger than Joe. You. Oh, little Joe's right, horse. Come on. Look, you ain't gonna know it. Come on, Joe. You got it. We got it. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a taker, a fine physical muscular specimen of young rural manhood. There you go. Come on, let's go. See there. You can do it, brother. What's your name, sir? Horse right? Contending for the two hundred dollar purse. Oh, cut right. Do 
what I tell you. Just keep hitting him till he falls down. Yeah, hit him till he falls down. I'll be lucky if I can keep getting up. Will you stop worrying? This is going to be the easiest $200 we ever made. If it's that easy, how come you ain't fighting? Because this is your night. All right, five to one odds on Charlie Powers to win. Make your bets with a timekeeper here. Better. Ten bucks, mister. On horse, Cartwright. Uh, ten more here, on here horse. Here come on. Go. There you go. <laughs> I don't know what they're up to. Even that Charlie Powers doesn't look too happy. And neither do I, in case you ain't noticed. Come on, you haven't got a thing to worry about. What's up, Charlie? Ross, he wants Hank to take this fight. What? You heard her, Dugan. I'm not wearing myself out on these small town hicks. But it's not fair, Ross. Charlie's made Hank fight the last eight challengers. And you know he's not supposed to take anything harder than exhibitions. Charlie, she's right. You know Hank here ain't been feeling so good. Who are you grooming for the championship? Me or this two-bit has-been? I said I'm not fighting a hick, and that's it. Nothing to it, Hank. You can whip that big boy with one hand. Just play with him for a while, then drop him. Tell you what. There'll be another $50 for that chicken ranch of yours. Ross, I don't think I should. Look, I got a lot of bets down already, see? Now you take this fight, or you and Ruby can look for another meal ticket. Now that's it, chum. Don't do it, darling, please. I'll be all right, sweetheart. Don't you worry. Here we go, Ross. Ladies and gentlemen, your indulgence, please. There will be a substitution. Oh. All right, all right. In place of the challenger, we will have that former great personage of the ring and still formidable pugilist, Ank the Kilcarney Killer, Kelly. Six of one, half a dozen another. And in this corner, the Virginia City strong boy himself, Os. This will be a bare knuckles affair and may the best man win. Don't worry, young man. Hank will go easy on you. Just give the crowd a good fight. This bout will be governed by the London prize ring rules. As each knockdown ends around. However, going to your knees does not constitute a knockdown. Both fighters will be given 30 seconds rest between rounds, eight seconds to come to scratch. Failure to make scratch forfeits the bout and to stand a man is the winner. Do you understand the rules? Yes, sir, I understand. Do your best to beat me if you can't buy. That's why I'll be fighting you. Now, there'll be no eye gouging, air pulling, elbow, and wrestling. You got that? There'll be no biting or kicking. That's been outlawed, too. I don't know what this game's coming to. All right, corners. Come on, baby. Good luck. It's time. Come to scratch and fire. I got to do it. Goodbye, ten bucks. 
made out of pig iron. What's your name? Am I all right? Yeah, yeah I'm all right. Well, if you're holding back, you're gonna have to get in there and hit him. I'll try, I'll try. Look, try faking it. Faking with the left hand and hit him with the right. I'll try, Joe. All right, time, gentlemen. Come to scratch your fight. Round two. Go on in there and get him. Come on. That's it, Dugan. What do you mean? He's not just out. He's almost dead. Consciousness yet. Ma'am. Ma'am. I just. I just want to tell you that I'm, I'm sorry. I. Sorry? Sorry? My husband's lying up there dying. And you're sorry. You're nothing but an animal. Many times in a man's life that he feels deeply for a person. There's nothing he can do to help him. Many times. Hank Kelly is a professional fighter. He knows what the risks of his profession are. Besides, you didn't set out to hurt him. Pa's right, Hoss. He's partially right. Of course, it's a fact that... Hank Kelly is a professional fighter. But when he hit me and kept hitting me, I lost my temper. When I came up after him, I, I came up to kill him. I wanted to kill him. I hit him as hard as I could, and that ain't right. Maybe I am just an animal, like Miss Kelly said. Hoss, Mrs. Kelly was very upset, naturally. 
But don't let what she said upset you. Why don't you go upstairs and get yourself some rest? Good night, sleep will do you good. Hmm? Yeah. Good night. Good night, sir. This whole thing started over a silly $200 bet. Downstairs, I couldn't sleep either, so I came out for a while. Yeah. Hey, did you? Did you hear about Charlie Edderman? He had a had a little boy. But they were surprised they had to raid girls. I don't think they expected a boy any time. Yeah. yeah a cute nice. little fellow, you ought to see him. Charlie's lucky. I'm sorry. For what? And nothing to do with it, Joe. Heck, I didn't. I, I was the one that pushed you in there. I thought the thing was just a big joke. I didn't. Oh, baloney. Baloney. Look, if I hadn't wanted to go in that ring, I wouldn't have gone in there. <sighs> Dad, burn it. There wasn't nothing you or them other two yahoos could have done to push me in that ring. I wanted to go in there. See, that's the problem, Joe. I wanted to get in there. Why don't we not talk about it, huh? No, that ain't no good. I need to talk about it. I, I've been thinking about it all night. That ain't done no good. I'll tell you something. I learned something, Joe. I learned something about myself. Something I don't like. I reckon every man's got it in him. It's some kind of an instinct or something that he's got down deep inside him that it'll make him do things that, that he wouldn't ordinarily do, except when he's scared. See, that's what I don't like. I got in that ring with Kelly and with Dad Bernie, he hurt me. bouncing his fists off of me, and, and it hurt, and he scared me. He scared me. That's the thing, see. He scared me bad enough, it brung up that thing from down deep somewhere that, that made me want to tear him up. Tear him to pieces, kill him. Kill him. Do you understand what I'm saying, Joe? Do you, you know what I mean? Mr. Cartwright? No, thank you, Hopsing. I got plenty, Hopsing, thanks. Mr. Horse, he not eat this morning. He say he have to go into Virginia City too early to wait for breakfast. I know. Poor Mr. Horse. What's the matter? He is all worried. Well, it's a long story, Hopsing. I get. I'd like to see Mr. Ross Cartwright. My name is Ross Dugan. 
Mr. Hoss not home. I tell Mr. Ben Cartwright, come in, please. Mr. Ben Cartwright, is that correct, sir? Yes, Mr. Dugan. Mr. Ross Dugan, sir. Manager, trainer, exhibitor par excellence. Oh. Pleasure, Mr. Cartwright. Hi, sir. Your son, Hoss, is not here, sir? No, I'm afraid he had to go into town early. Oh, I know this young man from the fight. Yeah, how are you? I believe in getting right down to business, Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Dugan, would you sit down? I'd like to say we're all very sorry to hear what happened to Mr. Kelly, of course. Has he regained consciousness? Unfortunately not, sir. And if he shouldn't, it might prove to be a great loss to me and to the world of pugilism. We've been together almost 12 years now, sir, ever since I rescued him from the obscurity of the coal mines in Wales. Oh, what a great lad he was, too. He liked losing my very own son. Well, I can understand that. I, I'm sure you must know how Haas feels, too, thinking he's responsible for it all. There is a why your son could have told him, Mr. Cartwright. That's what I came here to talk about. How's that? By fighting. By giving me and Charlie Powers the satisfaction of another fight. <sighs> Mr. Dugan, if that's the reason for your call today, I'm afraid you've, you've wasted your time. I came here to make a match, sir. The whole town wants a match. Why, don't you see the sensational thing it will be, sir? Why, Charlie Powers contender for the title versus Oss Cartwright, Virginia City's own strong boy, the man who knocked Aunt Kelly senseless with one punch. Oh, look, if it's a split of the bet, and you... Good <laughs> day, Mr. Dugan. Well, just a minute, sir. You don't think this is the end of it, do you? Why, there's more ways than one to make your son fight. I figured you'd be around. How's... You regained consciousness a few hours ago. I'm afraid that your punches did more than just knock him out, Hoss. You see, uh, he can never fight again. Yeah. Would it be all right if I went out to see him? Sure. Matter of fact, it might be good for him to have someone with him. Well, his wife is seeing Mr. Dugan. Don't make it too long, though. Thanks, Doc. Mr. Kelly? Oh, come on in. How you doing? I'll be all right. I've got a hard head. Well, I'll tell you, you sure gave me a scare. We're even. You gave me a proper walloping. Oh, no. That, that was just a lucky punch. Or unlucky. I guess it's according to which fella was looking at it. I didn't sleep too well last night. I was sleeping enough for both of us. When I, when I think what I've done to you. Oh, you've done nothing, lad. Nothing. I was a good fighter once, and with the proper breaks, I might have been champion. You want to tell me about it? Yeah, what's to tell? I was a miner. Migrated from the potato fields of Ireland to the coal mines of Wales. <laughs> yeah, when I met Ross Dugan. Ross Dugan. Was a down at the hills promoter from London. Somewhere he'd heard about that big Irish lad who beat everyone in the mines. And he came hunting for me, swearing that he could make me champion of the whole ruddy Commonwealth. So what happened? Yeah, he was a big, powerful ox. He was a ratty little nobody. We couldn't raise the kind of public interest. 
championship bouts demanded. Still, anything was better than the coal, and we made fair money. Yes, I beat and fought some of the best men in the British Isles. I was riding pretty high when we came to New York. <laughs> and then I met my Ruby and married her. As lovely a Colleen as ever came from the old country. She's gonna make her a queen, I was. In those days, I thought the easy money would never end. But everything ends, doesn't it, lad? Yeah, yeah, I reckon it does. But you were a great fighter. I remember reading all those stories about you. Yes, well, when I burned myself out for old Ross, there was Charlie. Another hungry lad to take my place. So I reckon you'll be quitting the ring now, huh? Quitting now? Quit? I'm a pug. I don't know nothing else. The doc says you gotta quit. Look, Hoss. You ever have a dream? Huh? I mean something you really wanted. Well, me and Ruby, we've been saving every penny to buy a little ranch in California, and we figured by the time we got to San Francisco on this tour, we'd have enough money to buy it. But, Hank, you, you can't keep on fighting. Well, it's that or lose the farm. Forget the dream. Ruby's begged me to quit, but I can't. At least this way, if anything happens to me... She'll get the fire. Look, Hank, I've been stashing away a little money, and I... Thanks, Hoss. I couldn't take nothing I didn't earn. Besides, Ross Dugan will pay for me expenses and doctor bills. And there's $500 he's keeping for me towards the farm. Yeah, I'll get the rest of it somehow. <laughs> Medical care. Why, you must be punchier than your old man to come here with that idea. But you owe Hank that much. At least that. I owe that stumble bum nothing. Hank has given you everything. Everything he was and had. Sure. Thanks to him, I've lost practically our old bankroll. Ross, he needs help. That's your problem. All right. You're holding $500 of Hank's money. The money for the farm. I'll take that. That money's gone. Gone? What do you mean, gone? G-O-N-E, gone. It went with my own bankroll on the fight. I bet that is a special favor to Hank. I figured to get him his stinking little farm faster that way. Then he lost. You had no right to bet Hank's money without asking him. It's every cent we had in this world. Have you got the money to hire a lawyer and take me to court? Oh, look, ducky. Yes. I'm a businessman, see? And Hank was bad business for me. On the other hand, I'm not a heartless sort. Let's say you, or Hank, was able to convince Oscar Cartwright he ought to fight Charlie here. Ooh, think of the gate that kind of a fight would bring, eh? Why, I might be able to dig up enough money to pay Hank's doctor bills. Maybe even another 500 for him. How oh, could Hank or I convince Haas Cartwright to fight? Oh, there are ways. Why, your Cartwright's taking this thing pretty bad. And <laughs> these country yokels, they've all got consciences as big as freight wagons. Why, you could cry a little. You know? What you say, Ruby? Who's more important to you? Oscar Cartwright or your own dear husband? I once called Hoss Cartwright an animal. But I was wrong because I was afraid to face up to the truth. You're the animal. <laughs> That off pretty good, Dugan. Well, I was almost bawling, because poor old Hank lost all his money. 
You didn't bet a dime of it. You want that fight, don't you? Well, sure I want it. We get what we want, people like you and me, don't we? My, my, we're having a bit of a conscience fit now, eh? When I first started throwing anchor the dogs to make you champ, I didn't get no complaints. Now, you shut up, Dugan. What? Sure, I done my share of dirty things to get ahead in this game. But I can't forget what it was like to be hungry. Seemed like all my life I was cold and scared and on the run. And I saw others turn weak and go down grabbing for nothing but a handful of air. And I swore right then that I'd never be one of them. Like Hank. Oh, you ain't like Hank. When I saw my first boxing ring, I knew then I was looking at the only hope I had of ever making something of myself. And I'm not going to give it up. We should have been in San Francisco by now, getting ready to fight Camel Heenan for the American title. Well, it's not my fault. How was I to know some Western bumpkin was going to beat Kelly? Oh, if we want to fight the champ, Charlie, we got to match his purse money. Five thousand dollars. Virginia City was going to be easy pickings. Instead of that, we've lost half our money. What well, was you thought Hank could take all these local yokels? It was you who wouldn't fight Cartwright, remember? Well, I want to fight him now. Oh, we're dead, Charlie, without that purse money. No, it's beat Cartwright or a handful of air. Nobody's going to stand in my way, Dugan. Nobody. First Cartwright, then San Francisco, and then London, and the heavyweight championship of the world. That's the way I like to hear you talk, Charlie. Nobody can stop us now. <laughs> That's Dugan's proposition. I think there's an easier solution. What's that, Mr. Cartwright? We give you and Hank $500 and pay the medical bills. Hank would never accept charity. But, ma'am, it's not charity. But see, Miss Kelly, I, I feel responsible for Hank. And I'd like to do something to make it up to you. I can't accept charity. Not for him or for myself. Now, Mrs. Kelly, your husband is a professional fighter. My son is not. Wait, wait, Paul. Look, Miss Kelly, I'll do anything in the world for you and Hank. Anything. I'll give you anything I got. I'll work. But I ain't gonna fight again. Ever. I didn't think you would. I can't say I really blame you. I was unfair to you. I only ask you to forgive me. Miss Kelly. What, what, what about the, the medical bills? You know, you owe something to Hank, too. And he need never know. Thank you. Thank you. I'll order those two forces. I've talked to Doc Martin. What do you think the Kellys are going to say when they find out you're paying up the bills? Well, there ain't no reason for them to know, is there? No, I guess not. You going to go up and see Hank? I'd like to, but I'm afraid Miss Kelly wouldn't be overjoyed to see me. Well, I'll meet you over to Silver Dollar. I have a quick beer before we go home. Fine. Right. See you in a minute. Bye. Hey, Little Joe. How you doing, Bert? Have a beer, Cosmo. Hi, Little Joe. How's it going? Little Joe, uh, what about Hoss? Yeah, what about Hoss? Well, uh... Is he gonna fight Charlie Powers? <laughs> no, I should he? Uh, Smitty here says he'll fight. I say he won't. Yeah, but you two guys are doing an awful lot of talking about something none of your business. 
Well, most of the town's taking sides, little Joe. There's lots of coin rolling around that says horse can lick that professional fighter. And a lot <laughs> yeah. that says horse is plain scared to fight. You saying that, Bert? I didn't say he was scared. I I'm going to put my money on him when he fights Charlie Powers. Now, you both can save your money. So my brother Hoss isn't going to fight anybody, you understand? We understand. But what about Charlie Powers? He's going around town saying he's going to bust Hoss right in two. Charlie Powers got a big mouth. Hey, there. You see what I see? Hey, I sure do. Come on. Yoko, I think we have some business to settle. What, what business? Fight business. How would tomorrow afternoon suit you? Same place, same ring. Wouldn't suit me at all, Mr. Powers. When would you like to fight him then, eh? I ain't gonna fight him no place, no time. Fact is, I'm, I'm through the fighting. That's all there is to it. What he means is, he's yelling. <laughs> There's what he's scared of. Charlie Powers, the man that's gonna flatten a champion. Soon as I can get him to meet me in San Francisco. <laughs> Charlie Powers got horse cart right cornered in the street. He's trying to push a fight. Well, there's only one thing left. Coming home? Boss, I got some things to take care of in town. Go on home, little horse caught right. We don't want you to get hurt. <laughs> For a big man, you're all air, caught right. <laughs> Be crazy, little Joe. That fellow's a professional, and he outweighs you by a ton. You think my brother's yellow, mister? I think all you Cartwrights are yellow. So you turned and walked away from it, huh? Yep. Walked off. Well, that... That took courage. The hardest dead burn thing I read to do in my life. Well, just the same, I'm glad you did it. Yeah. If you could have seen the expression on little Joe's face. Well, Joseph is young, and you know how impulsive he is. When he's had a chance to think it out, he'll be as proud of you as I am. I hope so. Hey, I was going up to the north pasture when you came. Keep you company? Huh? Yeah. Fine. Joe. What happened here? Hoss, come on, come on. Hobson! Hobson, get some hot water and some soap and some alcohol. Yes, sir, Mr. Cartwright. Let's get some brandy. Yes, sir. What happened? I made a big mistake. I swung on. This one on Charlie Powers. I keep making wisecracks about Hoss and I lost my temper. What did he work me over? Charlie Powers, huh? What I'm saying. Hoss! Boys. Boy, that guy hits like a bull. Charlie Powers, next champion of these United States, is buying the refreshments, gentlemen. Step up to the bar. Hey, 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 hey.
Hold it, hold it. Horse Cartwright's in town, and he's heading this way. Looking for Charlie Powers. Did you see him yourself, boy? Sure did, mister. And I had never seen him look like that before. Look, he's going in this way. I came here for two reasons. Number one is Kelly's $500. No, see here, you. Give it to him. What? I said give him the money. There's my first fighter. Remember, the odds are five to one. You're covered, Yokel. What's the other reason? A little gift for my little brother. Come on! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! We gotta do this thing properly! We gotta do it in the ring! We gotta throw Deacon straight and fast! Nobody knocks me down! You got your fight right now! Come on! Charlie Powers and Horse Cartwright, they're tangling in the silver dollar. <laughs> oh, ho, 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 ho. <laughs> hey, Kelly, you get back in that bed. You're a sick man. Yeah, I never felt better in my life. I've been waiting five years to see Charlie Powers get his lumps, and I wouldn't be missing this for the world. <laughs> Cut you to ribbons. Pay this, Hank. Your five hundred dollars riding on me. Now we can whip him, Hoss. He's got a weak spot right here. He can't take it there. All right, Cartwright. Come on, fight. Now go get him, Yank. Watch for him to drop his guard.
Sam? You, you still got... You still got that money? I sure do, horse, right here. Five hundred dollars. At five to one, that's twenty-five hundred dollars. Mr. Kirk. Oh no, Haas. We can't be taking this. You won it. Hank, you won it. It's your money. It's a five hundred. You had riding on me. It's, it's just growed a little, that's all. Goodbye, man. Goodbye. Yeah. Hoss, what can I say to thank you? Ma'am, you just made my whole day right then. <laughs> ben, you've got a wonderful son. Thank you. And you're quite a man yourself. But stay in the middleweight division. You're a champ there. I'll take your advice. And you, you big lug. Listen, if you ever get the notion you'd like to be heavyweight champion of the world... You're in the chicken raising business from now on, Mr. Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, champ, let's get along home. We have some post holes you might try to flex your muscles on. Yeah, and since you're so big and strong, I think I'll just sit there and watch you. You're my idol. <laughs> <laughs> 